All right, so I have Stacy Brown sitting next to me. Well, you're t- tell him your credentials. Uh, I'm a local family physician. I've been in town for 22 years, and um, I'm the medical director at the hospital districts, uh, healthcare districts, a rural health clinic. And uh, where I happen to be a patient, and very happy to have the rural health clinic and the outstanding service that they provide. Thanks, Bill. We That's the truth. That. Yeah. So we're here talking about the COVID-19 outbreak. There's been a lot of hype, a lot of misinformation, and with misinformation comes fear and anxiety. So we're here to spread some truth and hopefully relieve some of those anxieties. You betcha, you betcha. So just what the heck is COVID-19? So you know, COVID-19 is a, uh, is a strain of viruses called coronaviruses. And coronaviruses have been around for a long time. They cause different kinds of illness. This just happens to be one of the uh, types of coronavirus that's a, a novel one. Um, again, you've read and seen a lot of information about this. It originated uh, out in China. Um, like a lot of novel viruses out there, they can... Uh, be uh, found right at the interface of animals and people and so you know bats or pigs or uh, or other animals uh, and birds remember the bird flu from uh, a while back sure do so uh, those uh, they kind of uh, spring up and since the the humans haven't seen that type of uh, a combination virus before it can uh, spread pretty rapidly and there's not a whole lot of uh, natural immunity that we've built up to those type of new viruses so since we're trying, we don't have the great immunity to the viruses. What's the what are the best ways to avoid getting the COVID nineteen virus? Well, like any sort of a respiratory virus, uh, like influenza, for instance. Um, you know, it's a lot of it's um, just avoiding you know getting sick in the first place. So avoiding sick contacts. Um, if it looks like it's spread by respiratory droplet, which is what we you know think that the the coronavirus is spread through, uh, you know covering your mouth when you cough, um, you know washing your hands. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many times you know in a, in an hour people have a tendency to touch their faces, or their noses, or their mouths uh, with their hands and. Uh, You got to remember that, uh, you know, if you're touching something and then you're touching your mouth, that's like breathing a respiratory droplet in and uh, you may get sick if it hits those mucous membranes. Very good. Now, the big thing that we've all seen is people wearing masks to prevent getting the disease. Is that an effective way to prevent you're getting infected with the disease wearing the mask that people are wearing. Yeah, you know, uh, if you think about, you know, breathing in a respiratory droplet that's, uh, you know, got virus in it, if you can prevent, um, uh, you know, breathing that droplet in or getting it on your mucous membranes, that's a pretty effective way to prevent this. So, uh, you know, CDC calls this uh, something called a source control. So if it looks like you're the one that's sick, uh, and you need to go do something, uh, then uh, you put a mask on yourself so you can decrease the amount of droplets that you're producing. Um, and of course, caretakers or healthcare personnel um, uh, wear a mask to try to prevent inhaling uh, that drop or getting exposed to it. So for instance, if we you know, send uh, somebody home for home quarantine or, uh, or, or staying at home to, to recuperate, um, we want to have the, the mask on that person that may be uh, you know, spreading the virus, but also the caretakers that may be uh, helping that person so that they don't get that transmission too. We don't know exactly how effective those, you know, those uh, standard you know, surgical masks uh, uh, over, the, over the counter, over the drugstore counter uh, looks. We think that they're pretty effective. Are they 100%? You know, no. Um, but uh, at this point, uh, they're certainly better than nothing. Very good, because that has been like a what I've seen just everywhere since this started on television, and people wearing them over their mouth and not over their nose. Yeah, and I think if you're going to wear a mask, you know, put it over both, you know, the the generating uh, viral, you know, uh, things out there. Right. <laughs> See, I, I used to work at NIH in the OR, so I'm real sensitive to that. Mm-hmm. I'm real good still about not touching my face. Yeah. Because you know, when you got goop on oh, your hands, yeah. you don't want to touch. Every your face. time you know, I tell my patients, you know, uh, every time you think you want to scratch your nose or you know, rub your rub your lip or your eyeball, think where have my hands been? What have they touched last? When was the last time I washed them? And uh, you know, if you have to, you know, use your your elbow or your wrist or something instead of a uh, uh, you know a fingertip that may be you know contacting some respiratory droplet on the countertop. And one of the big things that they're not quite sure of yet is how long it can live on hard surfaces. 
Right. And, you know, that's why we talk about these high touch surfaces, you know, the the uh, the places where we always put our hands, countertops, you know, railings, car doors, doorknobs, those kinds of things. Those are those high touch surfaces um, and trying to wipe those down in, in some uh, in some, you know, fashion. Um, you know, we don't know exactly how long it lasts, but if it's going to be like some of the other viral uh, particles, it's, it's going to be lasting for, you know, up to maybe a couple of hours. I was recently at one of our great Mexican restaurants here in town, and they have a doorknob to enter. And I, I've, I've noticed a lot of people, huh? <clears throat> oh, yeah. let me get the door. Oh, yeah, thank you. For you. Yeah. And then people going in, getting served their chips and salsa, oh, yeah. and immediately grabbing the chips without washing their hands. Uh-huh. The, and then going back. And right. going back for it. Yep. We just had uh, Bob Todd's memorial service Saturday. Right. And they set out group things of chips and salsa mm-hmm. and group things of M&Ms. And one of people that I, I know real well and is very informed on the subject. Yeah. Kept, <clears throat> I know. It's just ha- and, it's and ha- reaching it's like in for the M&Ms. It's habit, you know. We, we, but if we get into a better habit of thinking, where have my hands been? Where do they need to, uh, to, to be washed uh, before we touch things that go back into our mouth? That's great. You'll actually see some, uh, um, some places in town that have um, ways of opening you know, doors, like in the men's room, where you don't touch the doorknob. Right, mm-hmm. it's either a push open or there's a, there's a little wrist handle or an elbow handle that you can pull on. That's, that's brilliant. It is. And nice forward thinking when they installed that whenever. Exactly. Those touchless or, faucets, you know, where you, rub, you wipe, love those. wave your hand into them. Have perfect. them at home now. Perfect. Exactly. So um, what is the standard of care or do we have one yet? For COVID nineteen, you know we we do. Um, I think this uh, this gets us back to fig- figuring out as far as like testing and surveillance. You know, is it prevalent in the community? And we're really uh, uh, in the infancy of that. Uh, Public health department has been able to do some limited testing for us in Inyo County. Uh, now that uh, commercial testing is available, we have LabCorp to the north of us. That's our send out folks. They, uh, they've received, uh, uh, I know, at least uh, four swabs from us uh, at the hospital district to, to do some testing on. Um, but it's really limited at this point. Uh, we can't test everybody like South Korea. South Korea was like testing, you know, 20,000 people, a, uh, you know, a day. Massive effort. Um, we're just not there yet. Part of that testing is to figuring out how, how widespread is this in the community. Um, we have to think that it's out here um, uh, in the at least this this valley. We've got our neighbors to the north that's got positive cases. We've got neighbors to the south uh, in uh, Los Angeles uh, that's a positive. We're a conduit. Uh, you know, we have a lot of traffic. So my feeling is is that you know it, it's probably moving through our community. We just don't know it yet. Once we kind of have an idea on the testing, though, then we get into kind of treatment. And you're right. There's no specific treatment that's out there that's available like say Tamiflu is for you know influenza Um, a lot of this stuff is in development vaccines are in development but until we have a real silver bullet for this a real specific therapy it's the you know the same type of therapy uh, that we would uh, roll out for somebody who has influenza or another viral infection a pneumonia Uh, and uh, luckily this uh, this virus is uh, you know in 80 percent of the population is pretty mild it, it, it looks and smells like you know a, a, a flu-like uh, illness um, but in those vulnerable populations you know the older uh, older folks the folks that have um, immune systems that don't work as well um, people that may have lung disease um, you know those people are going to hit get hit a little bit harder so the therapies that we talk about the treatments that we talk about are really those uh, those supportive type of therapies for folks. You know, uh, do they need oxygen with a pneumonia with this? Do they need a hospitalization with a pneumonia? God forbid, do you, you know, do they need a ventilator and be, end up in the ICU? Those are the real kind of uh, treatments that we're looking at in the community. Um, do we have a, a enough capacity to do those kinds of things when people get that sick? So is Northern Inyo Hospital prepared with those things? Do we have enough ventilators and so on? Of course, we can't predict the future and know exactly what the demand will be. Absolutely. So what steps are you taking over there? You know, we've been working really diligently since last, since last Friday, like you know, hundreds of uh, hours of uh, putting our, our, our thinking caps on and some some long days. I feel that Northern Inyo Healthcare District is really prepared. We're, we're I feel, way out in front of this. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, supply lines for masks and gowns and, and, and face shields uh, right at the very beginning of this. 
Uh, we just participated in a survey with the California Department of Public Health, um, looking at how many ventilators do we have? You know, uh, you know, do we have capacity to handle those kinds of ICU? Uh, what kinds of surveillance are we doing here? Um, how kind? What kinds of things can we do to to test people and not just keep our patients safe who may be using hospital services, but also our staff safe? Oh, absolutely. You know, the uh, I think one of the real limiting factors uh, in these types of epidemics is healthcare workers. And uh, we need to pay real close attention to keeping uh, the healthcare workers safe so that we can treat the next patient that comes down the line and not be taking, you know, taken off uh, online because uh, we weren't prepared. Very good. I know the, uh, I forget his name, the ophthalmologist who was one of the first people in China to really call us, oh my gosh, he, he thought it was SARS because mm-hmm. the symptoms were very similar. Yep. Yep. That he ended up passing away from the disease himself. And a lot of healthcare workers have. Uh, my daughter's a healthcare worker at NIH. I was a healthcare worker there. I have a lot of good friends that still work there. Yeah. A lot of great people. So, uh, of course. Yeah, and to make, you know, to continue our, you know, fully functional, you know, operations, we're not uh, limiting services or canceling folks. Um, you know, to keep us working at maximum, you know, capacity through this whole thing takes a lot of effort, uh, you know, a lot of uh, planning, a lot of uh, really good workflows. Um, also, it takes a little bit of some, uh, some conscientiousness, too, from the public. You know, uh, you're going to see some signs up at the hospital to kind of limit uh, uh, the number of visitors that we have, you know, coming in, the non-essential folks. Uh, uh, we love our volunteers, but we, you know, sent them home uh, uh, to, to try to keep uh, them from getting exposed. So you're going to see really kind of tightening down of, of some of the, uh, the throughput, the traffic through this to really limit the exposure for both patients and staff. Now, there's a lot of hysteria, a lot of people buying bottled water and frozen food and toilet paper and Mm -hmm. all that. Now, Korea, as I understand, has roughly, what, a 99.3% recovery rate. So, of course, things change, things are different. But I imagine we would have somewhere around that type of success rate yeah i think you know i think it's going to be um a a, a fairly high uh, recovery rate for this remember that only uh, in 80 percent of the population this is a very mild you know illness uh, and we worry about uh, the, uh, the, the older population and those other vulnerable populations um, where there is a higher fatality rate. But in the vast majority of, of these cases, um, it's really containment. Um, it's really staying home when you can. It's not spreading the illness. And if we can kind of flatten the curve of, uh, of these folks uh, becoming positive and kind of recuperating at home, I'm hoping that we mirror those types of recovery rates in, in other places. Part of our job is to really kind of keep that spike of people uh, uh, down so that we can kind of uh, use our current resources to handle that uh, uh, the load that's spread out over a longer period of time. Now, we were discussing earlier, earlier in the season, we had the influenza A, or influenza B. Yep. And we kind of transitioned into influenza A, which I just had. <laughs> now, how can you tell? And we're, spring is springing. Yeah. So it's allergy season. Oh yeah. Still flu this season. This is tough. I, you know, I have to tell you that, um, you know, just yesterday we diagnosed, you know, nine cases of influenza. So, you know, a shout out to to everybody to make sure that they're still thinking about influenza. Um, it it acts just a little bit differently. Um, influenza typically has, you know, a high spiking temperature and some respiratory symptoms, um, kind of similar to coronavirus. But um, uh, if you've ever had the flu, which you can you can tell, you know, firsthand, Bill, that uh, you have those muscle aches they were oh my god that was the first Uh, thing yeah it feels like you've been worked over with a bat yeah uh and that's that's kind of less likely in coronavirus also you may have had a uh, you know a sore throat or a stuffy nose or runny nose again really uncommon in coronavirus so some some similarities uh but also some kind of differences that help us to to peel those two apart we have rapid testing you know in in doctor's offices and uh and the hospital to to test for influenza and so uh it's funny i I, um, I was testing somebody yesterday and uh, and I told them that you know they had a fever and a cough and I tested them for influenza and they were positive and I haven't seen a happier person that said they were glad to have influenza than that person yesterday Cause, right because they didn't have coronavirus and it's really uncommon less than a two percent uh, 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 crossover to have both influenza and coronavirus at the same time now if you suspect that you have influenza, coronavirus, COVID-19, 
what should I do? What do you do? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, obviously, we want to try to limit the exposure uh, on either one of those to anybody. Um, uh, I, I always, you know, tell people that you know they need to talk to their kind of primary care doctor, their their family doctor, their internist, um, whoever they see to get some guidance on this. Um, if we end up uh, testing them, there's always um, uh, uh, some concern on where we're going to test them, uh, making sure that you're not going to expose that worker that's testing them with a swab or you know other people. Um, so it's really kind of up to that primary care doctor to figure out what's the best way to have this person tested. Um, uh, ideally, you'd love to test for flu in the in the office, uh, you know, while you're uh, uh, with a person with the appropriate protective equipment on, of course, um, and and see if they have influenza. And if they do, then great. Uh, they don't have they don't have to be tested for coronavirus. Um, since there's kind of a limited um, a commercial supply of testing, we're really you know working on as a healthcare district uh, how do we manage that? Um, how do we keep people safe? Um, if you remember the old drive-through flu shot uh, clinic we had uh, a number of years ago at the uh, uh, at the clinic, great we're, service. Yeah, we're kind of in early development to uh, to try to put something together this next week. Uh, keep your uh, eyes and ears uh, uh, open on the radio, TV, and the and the paper for more information. But we're hoping to uh, maybe help the the region with some type of drive-in or uh, treat uh, drive-in. Uh, testing uh, that uh, has been real successful in places like Washington uh, and in other countries keeps the patient safely sequestered in the car, um, helps the uh, uh, healthcare worker in, in the right uh, gear to get that sample, get that person back home, uh, and, and get them results in a timely manner. That really is a brilliant solution. That's whoever came up with that. Good for them. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> D didn't touch you. No, didn't touch you. <laughs> uh, no, we've, you know, I'd love to be able to get this up and rolling. We're not, you know, ready for prime time yet. We're still working on some uh, troubleshooting workflows. But again, some sort of uh, widespread um, testing for common things that are in the community, like flu, like strep throat, uh, to kind of rule those out, and then moving forward with uh, with coronavirus testing, I think is really going to be critical in these next, uh, you know, one to two weeks. And just on a personal note, since I was in this week and had the, the flu swab painless. Not, I wouldn't do it recreationally. No, no, the the swab does go up there yeah. a bit. It's not comfortable, but it's, it's tolerable. 12 minutes later, I had the result. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and I bet you were, you were kind of relieved to have influenza. Well, I, I actually, <laughs> I was pretty sure I didn't have COVID-19. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. But, but yeah, it's okay. Influenza A, I can deal with yeah. this. I know what to do. Exactly. We've got great workflows for that uh, that kind of thing. I, uh, like I said, uh, um, as of uh, today's date, we haven't had any positive uh, uh, tests uh, for uh, COVID-19 in the Valley. Um, I, I think as we roll out testing in a, in a more um, widespread manner, we're probably going to pick up some. Um, I, I always tell my patients that, you know, now that we're testing for something doesn't mean that all of a sudden there's this vast number of extra people. You just have been able to identify it a bit better. Right. So, you know, once we start um, uh, diagnosing and testing positive uh, uh, for folks in the Valley, I, I want the public to know that, you know, we're, we're doing that to, to try to see, uh, you know, who's, who's infected and that those aren't just brand new cases. Uh, we're just getting a handle on, uh, on the demand. And if I suspect I may have, where would I go? So I go to the rural health clinic, my primary care physician, if they're not in the rural health clinic. Yeah. So again, I would I would uh, punt back to the the primary care physician at this point. There's some great screening tools that we've developed at the at the district level to kind of see if we fit some criteria. We're using CDC's definitions uh, and and some uh, some extra definitions uh, to protect those vulnerable populations. So really, it's a kind of a, a telephone screen, if you will, um, that uh, we end up using uh, to try to see whether their testing is even indicated. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that, you know what, this is really unlikely to be uh, COVID and you, we don't require testing. Um, once we kind of pass those uh, those those kind of checkpoints in a, in a uh, paper fashion, uh, then we kind of figure out how we're going to get that uh, swab obtained. Anything else to wrap it up that you can think of? No, I just wanted to let the you know the listeners know that uh, the, the 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 healthcare district is well prepared for this. We're still fully operational. Um, we've we've had a lot of good people thinking uh, really hard over the last week, um, and we've got some initiatives coming up that I think are going to really keep people safe. Take home messages are the same stuff uh, that you know Grandma told you: stay away from sick people, wash your hands. 
um, you know, don't touch your mouth uh, and uh, stay home if it looks like you can. Very good. Thank you. Stacy Brown, always Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure. Fist bump. Fist bump. Yep.